Wednesday night session for BIOS and for our MSL program where we're, we're having this great mix of learning from great leaders, but also learning a bit about the research that relates to the work that these leaders do. And tonight we're especially, lucky, I'm especially excited that we have Coach Dean Oliver with us. And I know a lot of you know of Coach Oliver, um, but I just want to say a couple words about him before we start. Coach Oliver was a great, among many things, I'll just say a few things. He was a really, really great player. One of the best players to ever play at the University of Iowa. And if you, a simple Google, you'll find all that's been written about him. Played for some great coaches with some great teammates. He went on to play in, in the NBA with the Golden State Warriors and then also enjoyed a, a long and successful career overseas. So a very distinguished playing career. And tonight, and then I'll say one more thing, as much as you read about Coach Oliver as a great player and now as a great coach, if you get to know him at all, those things pale in comparison to he is a wonderful person. He's, when we talk about in this program, um, people with character and integrity and who are good listeners and treat people well, He he's the epitome of that. So we're just really thankful to have you here, Dean, with us tonight. Um, so well, thanks for having me, Pete. I'll, I'll give you that 20 spot later for all those <laughs> I appreciate that. I'll stop embarrassing you now. But um, when when Dean and I spoke over this past week, we you know, there's a lot of different things we could focus on tonight in terms of research and that. But one thing that's um jumps out about him is just the fact that he was such a, a, a great player and then decided to make this transition from player to coach. So we looked at the research on that. It's it's actually a re relatively common thing that a lot of a lot of um, people who are very successful in sport then naturally want to stay in the world of sport. But one thing we find is that a lot of um, former players, especially those who are you know really good, kind of like Coach Oliver, it can be a real struggle for a number of reasons um, to make that transition from player to coach. So before. I asked Coach Oliver a, a few questions. I wanted to just share my screen for a minute and uh, look at just a, a little bit of research on that. What do, what do we know about that? All right, so how do I, oh, this is the same thing I did last time where I mess up when I try to, I have to, I didn't do my updates, so I can't share mine. Dang it. All right. I can help you. I can help you, Pete, probably. Do you need, I don't you want to send something to me? I don't. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll send this to you, Sarah, and keep talking as I do it. See if it tests my skills. Um, <laughs> all right. I can't even do that. I'm not even updated enough to do that. Darn it. Okay, that's okay. I only have three things to share. So the, okay. the this research, the, a lot of the research on career transitions, and then I will send it to Sarah after this, and you all will have access to it. Um. There are these three kind of key things that former athletes in the transition from athlete to coach go through. One, the first is what we that's talked about as letting go, and that the identities of so many athletes are so deeply rooted in being the competitor, being the one on the court or on the field, being the one who's training um, from childhood up through adult early adulthood that the letting go phase is often the most difficult phase for a lot of um, athletes again a lot of you are living that right now you're you're spending five six hours a day on training 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 you've been doing that for years to all of a sudden have it end there's a physical change but there's also a psychological mental adjustment all of that that happens that's the first thing that the research indicates the first phase that people go through um very common the second is what they call um re-identification which is to say that okay this big part of my identity that has always been there. I am a basketball player. I'm a soccer player. I'm a hockey player is all of a sudden not there. And it often is, it can be for some people rather abrupt, especially for those who have what we'd call like an unplanned um, termination of their athletic career. Meaning if you have a, you know, catastrophic injury, or if you tried to make a team, like tried to make the pros, but you didn't make it, you were planning to keep playing, but all of a sudden you can't and you're not, it's not a choice. You just can't play anymore. So those are the um, 
athletes we see have the typically have the the hardest time re-identifying. And the third the third phase we'll talk about is what we call the professional development phase, which is that okay, even for those who are able to let go of that identity and those who are able to embrace a new one, I am a coach. There there often is this um deep professional challenge, which is that now you have to kind of learn an entirely new thing. Even though you may understand the game you play, now your role in that game is altogether different. You're you're a teacher, you're a mentor, you're a recruiter, you're an evaluator, you're you're these tasks that are very different from what it was to be the point guard. So we're going to walk through those phases a little bit with with Dean and hear his experiences on how he's made sense of going through those phases. The first uh, question I guess I'd just ask you, Dean, is getting at that first one, the identity as an athlete. And so you, you, you had this time where you, you again, gr- tremendous college career, decorated, played in the pros, NBA, overseas. Can you tell us a bit, Dean, about like how did it, how did it end for you and what, what precipitated that? Yeah, I'll tell you what, I feel like you're you're going through my whole life as you talked about those three phases. Um, you know, definitely when I got into coaching, it was very abrupt. Um, I was playing overseas. I was after my 10th year playing professionally. Uh, pretty much my whole life was was focused around being a basketball player. And uh, I had tried to get into coaching for about, it was probably the third year in a row that I tried to get into coaching. I think my ego was a little bit big at the time as a player. I played for a long time. I figured, oh, you know, I can just jump into this profession anytime I want and somebody's going to hire me. So I had kind of poked around and talked to a lot of people and uh, I was really having a hard time finding an opportunity. And when one opened up, it just happened to be uh, Coach Brian Jones at North Dakota who happened to coach me in college. He was an assistant when I was playing at Iowa, uh, had an opportunity for me to come on staff uh, as an assistant coach. And he was at the University of North Dakota. Now I'm playing, still playing professionally. I just come off another injury, uh, which was another factor in getting into coaching. I was 33 years old, had every, the last three seasons in a row, I had had a lot of injuries. Um, I had two young kids uh, living in Las Vegas with my wife who's working in Las Vegas while I'm overseas for 10 months. It was really hard living. And so I was like, you know, I want to stay in the States. I want to get into coaching and I get this opportunity. And I'll never forget that, uh, that phone call when he offered me the job. Uh, and I took it immediately before I even talked to my wife. <laughs> that was a very interesting conversation. Uh, we're living in this nice house in Las Vegas, right by, you know, red, uh, Red Rock Casino, uh, big four bedroom house. And then all of a sudden we're going to move to North Dakota and move into an apartment, <laughs> a three bedroom apartment. And I'm accepting a job that pays about $27,000 a year. Um, but it was an opportunity and I knew I wanted to get in and I've been trying to get in for, for three years. And then finally, uh, I just, you know, knew I had, it was time for a change for me. Um, but as far as identifying as a coach it really took I'd say two maybe my third year before I was really starting to get comfortable of I always thought of myself as a player and and it was hard for me you know to to take the coach's side on a lot of things and and see it from that perspective uh, for at least two years in and I remember going through a phase where I was like you know what I'm just gonna I'm not gonna play anymore I'm not going to play men's league. I'm not going to work out with the guys because that was one thing I did my first year. And I kept getting that itch, like maybe I should be a player again. Maybe I should go back overseas. But to really get in that mindset of a coach, I had to stop playing and and, and totally uh, not get completely out of shape, but not be in the, the shape where I could still go um, and kind of give myself out when it got hard and go go overseas and continue playing because uh, I was committed to to becoming a good coach and uh had to had to think of myself of that way and it took a lot longer than I thought it would Dean can I ask you a question going back to uh 
when you were still playing. So one, it seems that one advantage you had was that you knew you, you still had options to keep playing. I, one of the things that we find is the biggest obstacles is when a, there's a sudden end to a career and athletes are caught off guard and they're, they, they, they think they're going to be playing for 10 more years, but all of a sudden they have no option. So you, you actually yeah. could have kept playing, but you knew who helped you. Like, who did you talk to that, a lot of teammates led you to on that, other coaches that, that that helped you develop the interest in coaching. Yeah, a lot of teammates. Uh, you know, I had become after playing ten years professionally and as a point guard. Uh, a lot of times, a lot of time was spent with teammates. You know, at my apartment. Uh, you know, talking them through some things, making them understand what the coaches uh, are trying to to get uh, them to do, or or motivate them and and you know after a while a lot of teammates were like man you should be a coach you know they they were kind of pushing me in that that direction after being around the game for so many years um and then one of my best friends uh, who who also is a coach had been pushing me into it Jerry Montgomery who is now the defensive line coach for the Packers uh he he had for years been trying to push me that direction and um, I was fortunate enough to to get an opportunity, but yeah, it, it was a uh, a big adjustment going from from player uh, to coach. This this other aspect that um, is in the literature a bit is that the life of a coach, and this is for all people in our program, not just former athletes. Like the life of a coach at most levels is not like a, you know, it's not a nine to five. It's not super predictable, and so you kind of jokingly said, you know, you call up, you call. Sarah at home and say we're going to <laughs> North Dakota. Um, part of it is you're moving from Vegas to North Dakota, but the other part is um, I'm going into coaching, which is itself an overwhelming kind of all you know. It's it's a heavy duty job. What? How did you think about the kind of holistic part of life? Like I'm still going to be a dad, a husband, but also a coach. Well, I tell you what, I didn't really know what I was getting into at the time. Um, you know, as a player, you see kind of what the assistant coach, you only see part of what they do. You kind of see them uh, at practice or or you see them at, you know, one of the scouting reports or, you know, you don't see all the, the work that goes behind the scenes and the constant, the hours that are uh, on the road and, and, you know, all you don't see everything that they do. So it was kind of eye opening uh, my first year as a coach. I remember meeting for hours and hours. I think we met longer to talk about what we were going to do in practice than the practices lasted. You know, we'd meet for three hours and practice would be two hours. So it, it was eye opening um, that first year. And then I remember after that first year, I had to decide, like, is this what I really want to do? Because it's going to be long hours no matter what, you know, level. Everyone's working hard. Everyone's competing. But I think it's that competitiveness. Uh, from my playing days that made me want more and said, I can do this and I can balance family life. And obviously you got to have the support of, uh, of your wife or significant other, because uh, it is a lot of hours away from the family and, and a lot of sacrifices. And there's like the jarring of, you know, making the move going from one place to another, but then there's like the actual tasks that the work entails. And that was part of what we read again in this is that some of the things are transferable, like your understanding, like you being a point guard, for example, you had a natural like court intelligence and you know things about how the game works. And you could say that for most sports, you know, someone who's like one of the leaders on the team as a competitor has that advantage. But were there certain tasks and um, skill sets that you had to develop anything from learning the technologies of, of, of coaching or of I, I want to also ask you about what you had to learn about recruiting, but first kind of the, the skill sets that you had to develop as a coach. What do you remember about those initial years? Well, I remember that, you know, the first year, first couple of years, um, it was really hard because I had played at, at a pretty high level, obviously. And it, we, I was coaching um, at a, a, you know, not a high major, kind of, kind of a little bit lower of a level. And it was really hard for me to get guys to do things that just came so naturally for me uh, as a player. And then all of a sudden it was like, yeah, you got to learn how to teach. <laughs> You're going to have to learn how to get them to do these things. Or And it isn't just a motivation thing. It's a, a technique thing. So a lot of things that I did as a player without even thinking about it, 
all of a sudden I had to learn how to break it down and really teach it and, and uh, get them to do it uh, and build a habit that they could, that was repeatable or that they would understand. Uh, or I had to find another way to do it. Maybe they can't do it the way that I was uh, always doing it. And, and, and then another thing was I was, a, I was always a point guard. Um, so that position was really easy. It was really easy for me to work with guards. Um, and then all of a sudden we'd break up and, and I'd have to work with the bigs. And I was, I was like, oh man, I haven't done a lot of big man drills. So I have to learn how to do these drills and teach it this way and, and understand what they're thinking. Um, so it, it took a lot for stuff on the floor, let alone the, the other things, um, the technology that's involved now, uh, you know, we, there's this thing called synergy sports tech where we can watch clips from every game <laughs> known to man almost you talk about nba games college games um fiba games in europe and it's possession by possession you can it's broken down and all these different things and it was like the first time i saw that it was <laughs> it was like a drug i couldn't stop watching all this stuff but it, it was almost like information overload so you had to learn how did i use this how does this you know, how can we apply some of these things that uh, we're finding on film that other teams are doing and, you know, what applies to us? And uh, it, it was it was overwhelming at first, but that was a lot of fun uh, getting to learn about Synergy and all the different technologies. And Dean, what was your um, relationship like with the other coaches on that first staff, for example, um, at North Dakota? Again, part of this is like what um, how did you know them? How did you work together? But then also you had gone from this really high level of playing to now being kind of the low, low person on the totem pole or whatever you say, you know, bottom of the bottom, of, bottom of the uh, hierarchy, all of a sudden, how, how did they help you through that? Well, they knew they had their hands full the first couple of days, uh, first couple of meetings, they knew I was pretty green. <laughs> I didn't really know what I was doing. I was talking a lot, um, but but they had to kind of lead me through. Well, this is how you got to how we do things here and how you get, you know, guys to do things. So they brought me along really well. I think the the hard part was kind of the recruiting part. Um, you know, I never thought of myself as any type of kind of salesman, you know, and, and all of a sudden when you're recruiting, you're 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 selling your program, you're selling yourself. And that part was really hard. You know, I, I'm not gonna lie, as a as a player for 10 years, you come in with kind of this ego that like, oh, I shouldn't have to do these certain things. And all of a sudden it's like, uh, you know, the head coach is giving you a list of 25 guys and he wants you all, he wants all, you got just got to cold call them, um, you know, at a small school like North Dakota, that's kind of how you recruit. You, they don't even know where, you know, you're located. So it's, it's little things like that that was really uncomfortable uh, for the first couple of years, um, it was very uncomfortable doing those things. And, you know, a lot of the other assistants would bring me along. Hey, why don't you listen to this call? Uh, this is how I go about it. Uh, first call, this is how I set up a system. You know, everyone kind of has a system that they do. And, uh, you know, you just start learning from other, other coaches. And then when I'm on the road, you talk about things and see how other um, coaches are doing things, other programs are doing things and try to bring it back uh, if you like it to your own program we talk about the instability of coaching a lot but you've actually had this you've continued in your journey to um, you know go to better and better places and um can you talk about that a bit and how did you make decisions about it's time to change it's time to go to illinois state or it's time to go to madison mm -hmm. um, how did those processes work um, and how did you make those decisions? Well, I tell you what, a, a lot of uh, this business is is networking. It, it's people, um, you know, talking to each other about uh, their staffs and how it's going and what's going well. And and uh, I was fortunate enough that to work for Brian Jones, um, and he honestly was he was trying to help me get to the get to a higher level. He he knew that. Ultimately, I wanted to be in the Big Ten. I played in the Big Ten. Um, and then I am I was familiar with the Missouri Valley Conference. So he had talked to Coach Dan Muller about me 
at Illinois State and was fortunate enough to just get an interview. And then once, you know, I got the interview and got a job offer, I got to work for him for three years. And then it was a similar thing with Coach Guard. Um, we had done really well at Illinois State. Um, we had a, a, a point guard, Paris Lee, who was player of the year um, in front of Fred Van Fleet, of all players at Wichita State. And uh, at the time, Coach Guard wanted someone to come in and uh, work with his point guard, Demetri Trice. I, and I was fortunate enough to get that opportunity. And, and you know, I know Dan Muller uh, helped me with that also. So a lot of this business, it's, it's about – constantly networking and trying to focus on uh, doing a good job where you're at. And if we didn't have the success that we had at, at North Dakota, I wouldn't have been at Illinois State. And if we didn't have three great years at Illinois State, I don't think I would have made it here. Obviously, when you have a chance to go to a great Big Ten institution like this, it seems like a no greater in some ways. But if you take away like the prestige of a place, what are the things you're looking at when making a decision about what job to take. And now a lot of us have no options. We have one and we just have to take it. Yeah. You know, like you get one offer and you just, that's where I'm going. But if you have a few different opportunities, what are the things you're really cued into about whether it's a good opportunity to pursue? Yeah. I think you got to look at um, who you're working for is a major part of this job. Um, it can be a miserable, miserable job. If, if, you're not enjoying the staff and who you're joining because, uh, you know, the same way the players are a team, the coaching staff's a, a team, uh, all, all, you know, pushing in the same direction. If you get pieces that are pulling different ways, it can be miserable uh, and not worth the money. <laughs> Obviously, in some of these jobs, it doesn't pay a lot of money. So it's like you got to really look at the situation uh, of the staff. You have to look at, you know, what, what, what are your chances at, you know, helping these guys? Is it type of kids that you can help? You know, do, can you relate to the the kids that you want to recruit there and can you help them out? And I think that's, it's all about fit. I think it's the same way when you're choosing a school to, to play at I, as a player, I think you want to look at overall fit as far as the, the job goes. I have just a couple more questions, Dean. And then if anyone else has a question, uh, it's great. No one has to ask one, but if you have one, uh, you're welcome to do so. Um, Dean, I'm curious about, so you got into this rhythm now, now you've been coaching, you've been so successful. You've been on these great staffs. You're on, you have this great group here that you've had and had you, you as a unit, you've worked so well together. How do you continue to grow as a coach purposefully at this stage of your career? Well, you have to constantly be uh, evolving. It, it is, not only is the game always changing and evolving, but just culture, uh, how you can talk to kids has changed greatly since I got into <laughs> coaching. Uh, some of the things that and ways you used to motivate kids, uh, now you would get fired for doing some of those things. Uh, and the kids don't respond um, to those same types of motivations that when I first got into coaching. So you have to constantly evolve and learn from other uh, coaches and learn from mistakes. It, a lot of it is kind of trial and error. Um, you try different things. You got to be open to trying new things all the time. Um, there's a lot of coaching clinics. Um, I know, especially in my first probably five or six years, I went to a lot of clinics every year, um, just learning, you know, different ways of doing things, different systems, uh, basketball wise, um, even just talking about the mental aspect of, of coaching, um, and motivation and, and so much, I wish, you know, if I knew I was going to be a coach, I think I would have been in, went into like psychology or something because so much of what we do, uh, is in that field of just trying to help guys, uh, deal with the pressures and demands, um, time man management, all those type of things. Um, so in, in uh, reading a lot of books, Coach Guard's real big. Uh, it seem, seems like you'll be in the office and all of a sudden there's three new books on your desk and he doesn't say anything. He just leaves them there and they're always a good read and something about leadership and different ways of doing things. Um, Dave Anderson, a uh, motivational speaker, comes in, talk to the team, has a few books. Um, guys like that, you know, those are, uh, you know, always looking for ways to, 
uh, continue to learn. And, and then we also have to kind of um, check ourselves and, and live to what we demand. Uh, a lot of times we talk about all these things, but you really have to live it uh, if you want your players to follow it. So, um, you know, there's uh, Championship Productions. Uh, it's a company out of Iowa. They have a ton of uh, coaching videos in different sports. I'm, I'm talking about thousands and thousands and just about any subject uh, strategy wise, you can find some great coaches and watch their video, how they teach it, how they implement it to their team, you know, what stages they do it in. Uh, sometimes it's a little watered down. Uh, they don't tell you all the tricks of the trade, but um, that's been a great resource uh, throughout my coaching career. We still use that quite a bit. And I know there's a few other ones that are similar, but I uh, just, you know, and then my, you know, past experience as a player, uh, you know, that that's things that I can relate to with the guys. I always try to, you know, bring that into the fold as far as helping them as much as possible and, and constantly trying to relate to what they're, uh, situation is and, and how can that maybe some of my experiences as a player relate to them and help guide them through some things but just always trying to learn you know soak in as much as you can uh, us coaches obviously we like to talk a lot so we're on the road we're always we're always discussing our problems and solutions uh, and how to fix those things and get ideas bounce things off other coaches so uh, it, it's a constantly evolving game and uh, that's how we're always continuously developing uh, you know we never think we have figured it out well I'm glad you brought up that last point about how you know I framed some of this in a negative light and some of the research does in terms of like it, there's this challenge in overcoming your athlete identity and becoming a coach but the reality is I have to imagine on the balance of things it's still better that you were an athlete I mean that you're you're what you bring to your job is that much richer because you lived it. And so yep. is it, is it, is that mainly with regard to your ability to empathize with what the guys are going through as well as your understanding of the game? I, I think at times, yes. Um, it, it helps um, to understand where they're coming from. Uh, a lot of times they may have a, a certain gripe and that because I'm a player, I was a player. I can understand if it's a legit gripe or if they're just whining, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that I kind of have a, a little different perspective. I know playing for Dr. Tom Davis, uh, Dr. Tom, when I played for him, you know, he was a pretty good, I think division three athlete, but in my mind as a player, I was like, he has no idea that I, when I say I'm tired, he doesn't, he doesn't get it, you know, but, you know, coming from a, a former player, you know, uh, coach Walker, who was an assistant at the time, if he told me the same thing coach Davis did, I would believe him. Cause I felt like he was a player and coach Davis wasn't. So in, in that respect, sometimes you, uh, it does help uh, to have some playing experience, but it's not necessary. You know, like I said, if Dr. Tom was a, a heck of a coach, coach Gar is a, heck of a coach, you know, th those guys didn't play at my level, but they obviously know how to teach the game and have, has had a ton of success and will continue to do so. Well, for everyone listening, I, one, one of our, one of my sons helped out at the Badger basketball camp this past summer, and he came home one day and said that Coach Oliver was demonstrating a ball handling drill one day, and he said, I can't believe how he can still do that. And I, and I, so I followed up with coach Oliver and I said, do you still work on your handle? Like, how can you still dribble like that? And he said, it's like riding a bike. So exactly. Never leaves <laughs> you. It definitely left me many years ago. So I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> well, dribbling the ball was, the, was the easy part. It was the shooting part that I had a problem with. I bet you could outshot me though. <laughs> oh, I don't I do not think so. Does anybody have, Questions for Dean, for Coach Oliver? He's been very generous to stay late. At He's still in his office. Uh, <laughs> Michael. used to late hours. Yeah. Um, so if you were to kind of like put yourself back, you know, just starting to like look for jobs after, you know, you're done playing, mm -hmm. would you more look for a program where you're going to come in and be lower on the totem pole? Or would you kind of look for maybe like a, a smaller program that you can jump into and kind of have more of a, 
a more of a say on how things build uh, as you start to like build your career? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, looking back, um, like I said, I was trying to get into coaching for three years. And I think part of the reason I had a problem getting into coaching was because I, w- I was looking for um, the perfect situation. Um, but at a time, you know, it, it depends on what opportunities you have, but you do want to get your foot in the door, but you also have to be careful. Uh, if you have an opportunity to do more things, obviously you're gaining more experience. Uh, and, and that's what this is all about gaining experience so that you can do a good job and then move up the ladder. And, and the only way to move up that ladder is to get that experience. But, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things involved with those decisions, you know, family decisions, all that, you know, how, how far away can you move to? I remember looking at when I, before I took the job at North Dakota, I was looking at taking a grad assistant position at the University of New Mexico State. Uh, Coach Menzies, Marvin Menzies um, was offering me the job there, but there, there was a big barrier that I had to move to uh, New Mexico State and I had to go back to school. And, and I wasn't ready at that time <laughs> to go back to school. And fortunately, I got another opportunity and it worked out. But uh, you got to, you know, look at those things. But the key is you got to get some opportunities in the first place. So you got to get out there, uh, work camps, uh, get get in front of people, you know, show, um, you know, the, your skills and what you can do and what you can teach uh, in any opportunity you can get. So. Maria, you had your hand up. Do you still have a question? I do. I have somewhat of a two-part question that they're they're, they're related, but not related. Okay. Um, so the first question is um, trans- transitioning from player to coach and um, having sort of your career end sooner than you probably had anticipated. Is there a moment in your coaching career where you felt like your identity, I, like you identified yourself, like I am a coach now, I'm no longer a player I'm on a court, like uh, the movements are a a lot of still the same, right? And what I'm doing on the day to day, but my identity, what was that moment for you? If it has happened, or maybe it's a continue, like a spectrum, but from my identity as a player to my identity as a coach. And then the second part of the question um, relates to what you were saying and what we were just talking about a little bit ago, um, being the player and then being able to speak to a lot of things because it comes so naturally to you. Do you think there's any advantages for coaches who maybe never played their sport, but they're coaching in that sport? And what would those maybe be? So I I can repeat those if needed, but um, those are my two questions. Yeah. So the first one, I would say sometime in my second or third year, um, I started to feel like my identity had changed from player to coach. And I think a lot of that came from honestly disagreements with the players it was it was trying to get them to do something and all of a sudden it was like no I got to be the coach here I've got to get them whether it was off the court stuff or on the court like being a more of a father figure type to some of the guys and, and realizing you know what these guys are way younger I cannot you know be their best friend I've got to let them know that he ain't supposed to be doing this or that and and you know, really kind of getting into them. And, and that's, I think that was the first time I was like, you know what? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm definitely coach O now, you know, they call me coach O, but I didn't feel like it until it was, you know, I really had to, to put some guys in their place and it was more stuff off the court, but uh, that makes you open your eyes. Like I'm no longer a player. I've got to, I've got to make sure that they're uh, doing the right things off the court. And I'd say that was, the the first time and then your second question was second one again yeah um specifically for potentially coaches who didn't play the sport that they what what might be advantages from that perspective I really um see the advantages in being able to to teach um when you you know couldn't or maybe you did you couldn't do some things, but you can tell someone else how to do it. I think those coaches, they are able to break things down a lot better and make them more understandable to everybody on the team. Where that's what I really struggled with my first couple of years was 
like, geez, I'm just, just get there. You know, I'm just, I get the frustrations of uh, getting someone to do something quickly where a coach that didn't play at, at quite my level, the other assistants, they were able to break it down. Like, no, you got to move your feet like this. I never thought about how I moved my feet. I just did it. And so they could kind of get someone that, um, to do something uh, like as simple as a, a closeout. I never thought about closing out uh, and guarding someone. I just went and did it. And then if you break down the technique and, and really focus on the details, you start to see some improvement in guys. And I think, uh, you know, there definitely is an advantage, I think, to s some, especially coaches that, um, you know, while my 10 years playing over, you know, overseas and, and in the NBA, they were learning how to coach for those 10 years. So when I came in, I, I felt like I was way behind even guys my age they were coaching because they had had all this experience in teaching the game and didn't uh, spend 10 years playing. So there's some advantages, but there's also some disadvantages. You know, they, they I was so far behind uh, in my first couple of years of coaching and probably still behind a lot of those guys. A lot of those guys are head coaches at a high level places um, because they they had kind of 10 years of learning how to teach before I even got into it. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Thanks. Gerardo. Hey, Coach, how are you tonight? Good. Hey, I had a little question on, you know, given your tenure and your experiences as a college student and being involved in basketball so long, like how has NIL affected your culture? You know, um, like in high school, we're seeing it these days where you're seeing eighth graders now talking about what can the high school do for me instead of like a pride factor of like, I'm going to play for my high school to all the way into college sports where you're seeing money become a more bigger topic. Um, and I'm just curious on how you guys handle that and, yeah. and understand like there's one thing that I think UWD does really well and, and, you know, Peter and I discussed the family aspect of UW. I've always thought was important and and impressive. Um, so I, I'm curious as to like, how do you guys typically combat those these days? Because I'm even seeing it at the youth level all the way through the high school level. Not necessarily in like monetary cash amounts, but in just the the mentality of what you know my independent you know mindset instead of the team mindset you know coming across. That that is a great question. I talked about how we got to constantly evolve nowhere in time has college basketball changed so quickly to the last couple of years because of the NIL and the things that are going on. Um, one of the things that we, we try to do with it, obviously uh, we can't change it. We have to kind of adapt to it. And the way we've adapted to it is we've got to make sure that it, it's always about the team, as you said, um, and you're, you're doing things, for a good cause. Um, and it's never about NIL. Like we will not recruit players if they're if if that's their main reason is to make NIL money, this is not the place for you. You know, we want to make sure that it's never that's kind of like the cherry on top is that you get to do be a part of this program, uh, try to win a lot of games, uh, get these great experiences, build a brotherhood with your teammates and coaches, and guess what? You know, you're going to have some opportunities to help your community or whatever you want to help with in NIL. So that, that's how we get the guys to do it. But it's a constant struggle because uh, not just NIL, but I think social media in uh, the way to kind of build your so-called brand is through social media and pumping up, you know, kind of individualism and all those things, uh, which we don't want to be about, but at the same time, you can uh, limit your guys from being able to take advantage of, of some of those opportunities. So it's really been hard to find that balance, uh, but we just try to make sure we get the right kids with the high character um, that they really have to believe in the team, the team, the team. Um, and, and, you know, it, make sure that, they're realizing that this is is a short um, piece in in college athletics. It's a little piece of it, 
you know, no matter how much you know, there's maybe two or three players uh, in it, that make enough NIL money that they're going to be, you know, set for life or being able, nobody's retiring off of NIL money. What you want to have is get your education um, and be able to use that for the next 40 years versus, you know, 80,000, hundred thousand dollars that'd be gone, which uh, my rookie year, I'm sure that was gone in the first two months. <laughs> so just getting the right, uh, recruiting the right character and, and continuing to send that message to our guys is, is how we uh, been able to handle it so far. But again, it's constantly evolving. Uh, we have to look at different things to make sure that uh, the guys are in the right spot. We have to check in with them, um, see, you know, and make sure their their focus is in the right area. Uh, and matter of fact, we had to talk about a few things last week about it. So, um, just want to thank you so much, Dean, for taking the time here. It's been awesome. This is great. I had we've been spending a lot of time these last couple of weeks. Um, doing this project with the Milwaukee Bucks and we're asking them a lot of questions about when they are hiring people whether it's staff or looking for players or looking for coaching what they're looking for and they kept using the three words and as you're talking I just keep hearing the three words like as they relate to you and they're uh, humble hungry and smart humble hungry and smart and so when the Bucks are looking for players they, they always ask is he humble is he hungry yes. is he smart and so that's coach Oliver for all of us who are listening here he's those things and more so it's awesome for us to get to learn from you we appreciate that thanks for having me on for anyone who is uh, interested um you know we, we have recorded this you can watch it again share it with other classmates and also um we are having with coach jackson again this week it'll be a little different than the last several weeks and that it'll be at um 10 a.m friday madison time so Please join us, and if you have, if you have teammates or friends who want to join, all are welcome. Anyone, feel free to invite others. Um, open it up with Coach Jackson on Friday. So, hope to see you there. And again, thank you so much, Dean. Everybody have a, a great night. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. Coach. Thanks, everyone.